Welcome back to Five Acre Sunny Farm. I'm Tara Lynn, and today I'm gonna share just the teeny tiny tip of the iceberg about natural beekeeping because there is so much that I could talk about. Um, I do speak with beekeeping clubs and at conferences about this topic, but I wanted to kind of give you the highlights of how I approach this to help beekeepers and aspiring beekeepers think about keeping bees naturally in different ways. I've had a ton of new subscribers lately, so welcome. Um, I am a beekeeper in North Carolina. I primarily um, have my main apiary um, near um, Chapel Hill in a town called Pittsboro, and I have another apiary in Western North Carolina near Bryson City. I have been keeping bees since 2017. I'm a journeyman beekeeper, and I also am a certified permaculture designer. Um, outside of beekeeping, I'm also a writer. I've written for many different magazines. Um, you can find more information in the description. And I also maintain a blog about natural beekeeping, um, permaculture, and nutrient-dense food. And that is also linked in the description as well. Um, I am going to kind of jump into some different equipment and some products um, and different um, kind of accessories and things that you can use in natural beekeeping. So I'm gonna take you outside and show you that. When people ask me about natural beekeeping, I usually ask them, why are they keeping bees? Because everybody has different goals and it usually makes them smile because they really sit around and think about it. Um, especially where I am here in North Carolina, it is get very hot in the summer. So you really should have a good reason why you're going to put yourself through um, really sweaty hive inspections and honey harvests and general hive maintenance the expense um, and all of the, the different efforts that come with managing hives. So really thinking about why you're keeping bees. Um, I just wrote a post about this in my blog. I'll link to that below. And when I ask this, when I'm speaking at beekeeping clubs and at conferences, um, everyone has different answers. And that's the intent is that we all have different motivations. Um, some people are really focused on wax production and they're using that in body care or candles. Others are all about the honey, and so they're selecting um, different um, hives to, to grow and expand based on their honey production. Um, others are focused on pollination efforts. Others are just really loving the community and mentoring others. And there are also puppies getting into trouble. Hang on. And others, like myself, um, are focused primarily on hive health. So. Um, to me, if there is a surplus of honey, that's great. I'll take a little bit extra, um, but I primarily leave most of the honey on the hives um, for the bees. And that's not why I'm keeping bees. So I'm not disappointed if there's a, a bad honey year. It just happens that way sometimes. Um, so thinking about why you're keeping bees will help you determine what kind of management styles and inputs and approaches you want to take to um, managing your existing colonies and also how you want to acquire um, queens and acquire other colonies for your apiary. Breaking down the term natural beekeeping, it's a kind of an interesting exercise because it's a fairly oxymoronic term. If you think about how bees naturally live, they're naturally not going to live in a hive. So inherently by keeping bees in a hive, it's not natural. So, so there could be folks like myself who consider themselves natural beekeepers, but essentially we're, we're not because we're keeping bees in a hive. But there are different interpretations because there are no regulations about that term. Um, so without having a shared definition of what natural means, there's a lot of connotations involved with it, a lot of um, multiple multiple meetings so that we, we have this disparate um, collective understanding of what it is. Typically folks will describe it as keeping bees without chemicals, chemical free beekeeping. You can get really technical on a scientific level about what a chemical truly is. So, um, so I have to admit, I my only C in high school was in chemistry. So I'm not going to be an authority on all those different um, chemical aspects and getting down into the nitty gritty. Um, that's not my forte. Uh, but if we're thinking about, um, you know, having this 
problem of not having a shared definition, um, I like to reframe that as an opportunity. And it's a great opportunity for dialogue. It's a great opportunity to talk with other beekeepers, to educate your customers, if you're keeping bees and you're selling honey and other products from the hive. So use that as an opportunity to help educate consumers about this huge gap in how we label things. And it can help them see you as an authority and have a better understanding of, of bees in general. When it comes to natural beekeeping, like I just mentioned before, keeping bees in a hive, not so natural. Um, but there's also this argument of, are you going to provide supplemental feed or are you going to let them just, you know, let, let, the, uh, let the survival of the fittest kind of thing. Um, so most beekeepers know honey bee healthy. This is generally recognized um, as a, a natural beekeeping supplement, um, essential oils that you can put into um, a sugar syrup. Um, when that's not available, I also picked up Pro Health, very comparable products, essential oil supplement. Um, I have a separate video about making tea for bees. Um, so create, I'm creating an actual tea um, that you can use as a base for your sugar syrup using herbs. Um, so that's something that I've been doing um, since I've learned about it for the past few years. And occasionally, depending on the time of the year and the condition of the hive, I'll use a supplement like this in addition to that um, tea base as well. So on that topic of feeding and if you're going to supplement, um, you know, it's not just sugar syrup that you could be supplementing. It's not just essential oils. Um, you could also be utilizing corn syrup. Um, and then depending on what kind of sugar you're using too, um, that can also be open to interpretation how natural that is. Um, because it's pretty much not natural that bees would find a refined sugar syrup in the wild. So thinking of that too, but um, sometimes, um, you know, the colonies, if you're thinking about honeybees have existed for however many, you know, centuries and eons uh, of, of their existence that they've been here, um, they really haven't evolved too much compared to early findings of, um, uh, of bees. Um, so if you're thinking of like all of that time and how much the world has changed, how much um, their forage options have changed, um, some depending on where you're located, they may need a supplement. Um, where I am um, in Chatham County, North Carolina, all this background noise is construction. There are trees being clear cut everywhere and there's a lot of forage that's being removed. Uh, we also have one of the largest, if not the largest, beekeeping clubs in the entire state. So there's a very high density of beekeepers in this area. So if you're thinking of the competition for food, there's fewer natural resources for food and there's a higher concentration of honeybee population not to mention the native pollinators requiring you know their their own food sources so you're having all of that competition you may at times need to supplement um, with the colonies for their food so with that aside those are some things that that come up if you're going to be doing um, some type of feeding um, if you wanted to rely on more of a natural source of their food, you could um, take some of their extra honey um, during the honey flows. Depending on how many honey flows you have in your area, you could take some of that extra honey out and instead of harvesting it for yourself, you could put it in the freezer and give it back to them at other times of the year when they may have um, not as many resources. One of the other things that I, um, that I stress is that you can um, you can add a lot more forage to your property if you have some space. Um, a lot of people will ask what kind of flowers to plant, um, but you really should be prioritizing trees, um, especially like in our region, trees are the primary nectar source um, for, for honeybees in the area, particularly the tulip poplar. Um, and then in other parts of the state, you know, you've got black locust, sourwood, um, and of course maple um, pretty much across the state here. So thinking about what kind of trees you could be planting for, um, for nectar producing um, goals, um, which of course could be fruit trees. It could be, um, you know, like I'm just looking at the peach trees right now that are blooming. Uh, and uh, you could 
um, be prioritizing trees that will be blooming at different times of the year, like willow typically blooms out of um, sync with, with some of the other um, trees in the area. So, um, so looking at how you could add some of that more substantial nectar source rather than just a few flowers. Um, but if you do have like a larger space, you could think about a wildflower meadow um, and doing cover crops in a garden space. Like I'll do um, crimson clover. I've got a video about um, seeding that and turning um, lawns into more of a clover landscape so that they're actually producing something rather than just remaining stagnant. One of the other conversations that comes up a lot is um, how you're managing your comb. So um, the Certified Naturally Grown program, I won't go into a whole tangent about that, but um, some of their natural practices they recommend um, are removing 20% of your comb every year. So essentially that comes down to removing all of the comb from five years ago, you know, so um, dating your frames and, um, and then every five years just cutting out that extra comb. And of course, I forgot one of mine in the other room, but I brought this as an example. Like this is um, one of um, the frames that I'll be using this year. It's from a few years ago. I just didn't um, put it out um, that year. So I'll be changing the date on it. And this has a strip of plastic starter strip on it. And this will allow them to build out um, a full frame. And then five years from now, I'll be cutting this out and um, putting it back into circulation so they'll, they'll build out fresh comb. The idea with this is that um, that way, if you're having fresh comb and none of your comb is more than five years old, you're reducing the exposure to potential um, pesticides, spores, diseases that they may have brought back and may be present in the comb over that time. So you're helping to remove that risk of um, infecting future populations or from spreading um, to other colonies. And it's just kind of a simple practice to help um, help make sure that they're always um, living in a space that's relatively new and not like 10, 20 years old. Um, there's another camp in the natural beekeeping world that says you really want to use older comb because as, they're, um, as the larvae develop and pupate in the cell, they leave a little bit behind. And so the cells essentially get smaller and smaller over time. And the idea there is that it can help with potential varroa management um, the smaller that the cells get. So there's that other um, debate along that avenue of how old you want your comb to be. Managing varroa mites is, I feel like, one of the, the first things people think about when they think of natural beekeeping. So um, if you are considering like no inputs at all, you don't even want to use oxalic acid, which is recognized as an organic treatment, um, and on that more like scientific side, um, oxalic acid is considered an organic compound. It's not a chemical. So on that technical level, it's truly not a chemical. But if you're planning on not even doing that and you do wanna help support the hives and have a brood break to help reduce that varroa mite population, um, this is a queen cage. Um, some, be some beekeepers call it a queen condo because it's really nice. Um, gives the queen a lot of space to hang out. Um, this is also a queen cage or a little queen clipper and puppies getting into trouble. Again. The idea with these cages is you could purchase a queen and put her in here and then put your, um, your candy board, your little candy piece in here. And so she'll eat through that and emerge. Um, or you can go through your colony and find your queen and pick her up and then put her in here and close her up and have her hang out in here for a few weeks. And over those few weeks, um, the hive will become um, broodless. Um, you could at that point when you have uncapped, um, when you, all of the brood is completely uncapped, uh, you could do an oxalic acid treatment then because everything is exposed. Um, or if you, like again, if you don't wanna use any type of input, you could just cage her for a few weeks and then release her. And in those few weeks having 2,000 fewer eggs every day for a few weeks, that's, that is a food source you're removing from Varroa. You're removing their breeding habitat. So you're really knocking down their population considerably. So even that on its own can be really helpful. The other approach you could take if you don't have a big queen condo is you could capture the queen in here 
and let this rest between two frames and have it just hang out and it's not a lot of room for her but she'll be fine in there um and as just as like a side note with these particular cages they also come in metal and i particularly look for the clear ones because i have a hard time keeping an eye on her and not injuring her if i can't if with an opaque clipper so i want to have the clear ones so i could see exactly where she is so i don't hurt her so just keeping that in mind if you're going to be looking for these two I'm going to touch on two more things because like I said, this is the tip of the iceberg and I'm not even diving into all of the areas in each of these topics that I normally do when I'm speaking at a conference. Um, managing small hive beetles. Um, there are so many different approaches to that. I have been battling them like crazy um, at one of my apiaries. Um, but I wanted to mention these are beneficial nematodes um, or nematodes, depending how you want to pronounce it. Um, they uh, come in a little packet and you can mix it with a hose end sprayer or in a watering can and then you apply it to the ground around your apiary and they're pretty much microscopic worms and they run around the ground and will eat the small high beetle larva. I have a separate video about this about how to apply that um, in your apiaries. The other thing I wanted to mention which I have here um, that I'm kind of still setting up. I have some of the frames, I have the wax in them, but I have a layens hive. So the layens hive is intended to mimic a tree cavity. So it's, it's a horizontal hive. I have another video about this. Um, and so I'm planning on having this set up and um, getting some bees in it over the next month or so and learning about what it's going to be like to manage bees in this particular setting. This particular um, hive setup is intended more for natural beekeeping practices because it does mimic that tree cavity. It's also a fixed size, so you really aren't expanding this. So it really encourages swarming, which encourages brood breaks, which helps reduce the varroa mite population and just kind of helps the bees thrive in that way, or that's the intent with it. That's kind of a brief overview, very brief. <laughs> of the different um, natural beekeeping um, approaches you could be taking. I'm not even diving into some of the other topics that I really like to dive into, but um, let me know if you employ any of these um, practices and, and what your interpretation of natural beekeeping is.